Hello? Oh, there we go. Thank you, everyone. Well, I was really impressed with that last talk. Uh, I thought Facebook had a lot of code, but I now have some sort of minor inferiority complex happening up here. Uh, so welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Schrock, and I'm an engineer at Facebook. I've worked at Facebook for a little over six years. And for three of that, I've been working on GraphQL. And that is what I'm here to talk about. How it came to be, what it is, and what it means to our broader uh, open source ecosystem of software that we're building. GraphQL is a data query and data manipulation language for client applications. It's a way for product developers to express their data requirements in a way that's congruent with the way they think about data. If you're a developer within Facebook, and you write mobile code, and you access data, GraphQL is the language you use to access that data. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of GraphQL, I want to start with a story where GraphQL came from. <coughs> our, story, our story starts more than four years ago in 2007, when Facebook had to get serious about mobile. There was a revolution in computing, and it was the mobile revolution. And the failure to respond to revolutions like this has been, traditionally been a way that technology companies get consigned to irrelevance or the grave. It was a really important thing for us to focus on. Before that, we actually did have mobile apps. We had built like three people. And they're like off to the side, their own native apps. And they were just massive feature gaps between the website and the main app and the mobile apps. And we also kind of had a bias against this. Facebook was born as a website. The culture of Facebook is deeply tied to the culture of web development. And so this web, the notion of it being a website was very tied to our identity. So our first pass at this was to effectively do a hybrid approach and have HTML5 views in a native app. So we thought this is best of both world scenario where we could leverage our existing skill sets, but also get the, the features out of native we needed. And it, does, it was successful in some ways. We got feature parity of the website. We proved that mobile was really important to us internally by having actually a feature parity mobile, apps, uh, uh, mobile app, <coughs> but had serious problems. Uh, we used to get feedback that it was missing features. And now we were getting feedback that the apps were awful. Um, wasn't really the best trade-off. And you know, mobile web browsers just really couldn't handle the complexity of our application. Slow frame rates, frame drops, lots of crashes. It was kind of a bad time. So in the beginning of 2012, late 2011, we embarked on a complete rewrite of our native apps. And across the entire mobile surface area of the entire site. And this was a fact, effectively a de facto re-architecture of the entire Facebook system. So previously, we had a web server which delivered both data and UI in the form of markup, delivering to you know, hybrid shells in a native app. And now instead, we had app servers delivering data to UIs that were more defined on the client. And this had the, had the interesting effect of it was kind of a shift in the center of gravity of our product engineering from the server to the client. And we have hundreds, we have large number of engineers, and we're going to need a, a coherent internal platform in order to handle this. So we kind of started off with a RESTful API. And we, you know, if you saw Joe's talk about Relay, it, you, you know, we, th th we, this is born out of that experience. REST endpoints, you either have a bunch of multiple round trips with these single typed uh, endpoints that you get. Uh, and that's unacceptable for mobile applications in adverse network conditions. And then the typical fix for these problems is to end up creating a bunch of custom endpoints, uh, customized for each view. And that ends, up being become, that ends up becoming unmanageable and introducing a lot of entropy to the code base. It also is relatively tool poor. Clients generally end up hand coding their own parsing and then hand coding their own models depending on what endpoint they're going at. Uh, we need a more structure. More fundamentally, we really thought that REST and also any sort of SQL-esque API was really not the way product developers wanted to think. We don't think in terms of join tables and resource URLs. We think in terms of a hierarchy of data, usually aligned with the views that we're dealing with. Product designers and developers think in terms of graphs of data. This was really the genesis of GraphQL, to build a query language that aligns with the way that product developers and designers think. And this seemed to work. A few months after its conception, GraphQL was powering the native news feed. And the people were less mad, which made us happy. Um, today, GraphQL powers nearly the entire surface area of Facebook's mobile application, serving about 260 billion requests per day. Um, so this is real. It's in production. It's been in production for a long time. So 
what is this thing? What am I actually talking about? I think it's a fair question. And I'm just going to introduce the system through examples. <coughs> so here's kind of the hello world of GraphQL queries. I want to query my name. The first thing you'll notice is that it looks pretty similar to JSON, right? It's kind of a JSON-esque query language that returns JSON. Uh, fields have some subfields. We call these selection sets. So we send this, this query. It's just a string to a server that's parsed and executed, and it produces a response. And you'll see that the response and the query have a very similar structure. This is actually a very nice, intuitive property of the system. It's very easy to understand. Here's another way of accessing the same data. This is a user call, which takes an ID. Right? It's more programmatic. ID is a field argument, we call it. Fields should be really thought of as just functions. Right? It's a thing that takes argument that returns a value. And then you can operate on that return value with further uh, subfields. For example, here, this profile picture has three subfields, width, height, uh, CDN URL. Uh, and I bet you can guess what the response is going to look like. It looks exactly like the query. It's really useful. And then you can parameterize this thing. Right? Now it has a size of 300, and you get back the CDN URL for the thing that's a size of 300. Um, <coughs> you know. And then there's other features which facilitate, these feature that facilitate more capabilities. So here we have aliasing, so that you can request profile pictures of two sizes, for example. You know, a little pick and a big pick. And then the response looks exactly like the query yet again. You know, more importantly, GraphQL is designed to be able to send down the connections of data. Right? So here, I'm querying myself, my name, and my friends, and their name. And instead of having to do some sort of like inner join type thing or to do multiple round trips with, REST URI, with a REST API, you can simply do this in one declarative query. And so on and so forth. And you get the, the events associated with that person. Uh, so this ends up being very natural. So you've just seen kind of the hello world and basic functionality of the GraphQL language, but there is more to it. There's more than just a DSL that looks good on slides. Um, like I said, we think it's a really powerful mental model for product developers, because it models data requirements in a way that product developers and designers think about data. You know, at the core of this is a type system, which every GraphQL server defines. And this expresses all the capabilities of a GraphQL server. So again, let's just illustrate this quickly by example. Let's go through this query again. So at the root, at every single level in a GraphQL, theory, a GraphQL query, there is a type in context. So every single GraphQL schema has a singular root type that is the root of all queries. Here we call it query. There's two fields, me and user. This is a very simple schema. So we're querying me. That returns a user. And now the user type is in context, right? And so you can query things like name, profile, pic, and friends, right? Friends is kind of a connection-like thing, so you can or it's a relationship, so you can order by things. And here's an uh, interesting point. This is kind of the standard that we use, is that for all the order bys, we have enums. We can't just order by an arbitrary string. Uh, this is a deliberate API choice of Facebook, because we have to scale across 3 billion machines or whatever. So we can't just have. Uh, yeah, um, I, it's, a, it's an inferiority complex kicking in again. Um, <coughs> you know, importance is actually not a field on user, right? This is a software computed ordering of importance of friends. So this is why, you know, in your type aheads, the same people keep on showing up. Um, you know, order by importance. There it is. So as you descend down, right, every single step along the way in this query, there's a type in context and makes it so you can't query something that doesn't exist. Uh, and so on and so forth. Down here, users. We're querying different things on users at this level. And then finally, events. So this kind of flips the model that you're used to. Uh, typically, in a REST application, you're thinking about, I'm getting this model by ID. You get back the model. And then as you iterate your application, you have to change both the server and the client. right? And so on and so forth. GraphQL changes this mental model. Instead. The type system publishes the possibilities that you can query, and then the, the, the queries specify the requirements from the server. And this way, you're actually decoupling the client and the server in a desirable way. You're iterating your models and your views pretty much solely on the client, except if you have to create new data that hasn't been accessed before anywhere else in the application. This has been a very successful strategy for Facebook. We have a single GraphQL centralized schema that serves all of the applications that consume that data. 
But then there's another dimension here. And we release applications every week, every other week. So we have a ton of live versions of our apps that we have to support for all of time. And GraphQL really allows us to manage that process in a more coherent fashion. We actually have more than 1,000 versions of our various apps live. And as far as I know, they all work. Uh, and we, actually, we, in fact, still support that original iOS. Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> There are other important concepts uh, in GraphQL. So you know, these queries can actually get very complex. And <clears throat> so it's really important for us to have a fundamental unit of decomposition. Uh, we call this the fragment. It's actually it's kind of, it's as critical to GraphQL as functions are to normal programming languages. It's the way you manage complexity. Our newsfeed query has tens of thousands of fields in it. It's kind of insane. It's a really complex product. Uh, and the only th way it works is we can actually decompose the query into subqueries. And this, again, is really nicely aligned with view hierarchies. Typically, when you're building these UI frameworks that consume GraphQL, like Relay, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between fragments and the views that consume them. Right, I missed that slide. Interesting. So yeah, Relay, yay. Um, another <coughs> property of GraphQL, which is really important, it is backed by arbitrary code. It's not a storage engine. It's backed by your application code. This goes back to our newsfeed experience, right? Newsfeed's a super complicated product. It has a feed ranking backend, machine learning, big data, blah, 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 all the things. Uh, that returns a rank ordered list of IDs, which we need to fulfill with user databases, which return human readable data. And then we have other things like image caching and all that stuff. We have this existing layer of application code, which orchestrated all this, business object layer. We couldn't ditch that code. It represented you know, some ungodly number of man years uh, in, of engineering work. So GraphQL is an overlay on top of that existing application code. That means it's not a storage engine, even though it has QL in the name, just to try to confuse people, I guess. Uh, it queries over arbitrary code. That means if you adopt GraphQL, it can operate over the existing code. Right? And the way this works is the mapping between the externalized GraphQL type system and your code. So here's a simple user type with some fields. Right? And this is kind of an approximate pseudocode of what happens if you're in our JS refer reference implementation. Each one of these fields maps to a function. So the most simple one, name, just gets a property. Very simple accessor. Right? Here's profile pick. Profile pick actually has to do some computation. Poke at some configuration, construct a CDN URL, return it. And then actually you can get more fancy. In JS, you can actually return promises, an asynchronous primitive. And then the GraphQL engine is responsible for managing all this. We expect that any GraphQL core written in any language will take advantage of the asynchronous primitives that are in that language. Um, you know, executing GraphQL concurrently is a really powerful tool, and we do it aggressively at Facebook. It's really critical to success. This type system that I'm talking about <coughs> is also uh, critical to building client tooling. And the way we deal with this is actually, you can actually query the type system. So we needed a way of getting information in a structured way that's easy to build tools on. So we're like, well, we could just you know, query GraphQL with GraphQL itself, which is, you know, we're, we're still pretty you know, self-satisfied about this part of it. Um, <laughs> so on, in, every, in any uh, schema, you actually, we actually you have to expose this field called Dunder schema, which is a way to access the type system. So here we would like access all the types. And it's really, we call it introspection. It's a platform for building tools. Uh, and it's really powerful. So you can build things like a documentation browser. Documentation is actually in this introspection system. right? Um, you can do code generation, both in, say, Objective-C, or you could do it using Flow. Flow is our library for adding uh, gradual typing to JavaScript. and then. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do a live demo today, but we have this awesome tool called Graphical, which is effectively an IDE-like system for building GraphQL queries. Uh, it it's really sells the system. I was disappointed I wasn't able to do it. Um, <laughs> so that's GraphQL. So it started off as a tool for building newsfeed, and it's grown to be a critical part of almost all of our apps. Uh, and you know, when we built Newsfeed three years ago, we really had no idea how critical it would become to the way Facebook works. And we built it pretty quickly in a way that was pretty tied to our internal infrastructure. So over the past few months, we've been working on launching GraphQL, a kind of 
an improved version, we hope, of GraphQL to the open source community. And we released a technical preview in July. And we made a lot of progress. Uh, so the initial launch, oh, there we go. The initial launch included a RFC specification and a reference implementation of the system in JavaScript. Uh, additionally, the last few weeks, we've soft launched uh, the open source version of Graphical, as well as a toolkit for making relay compliant GraphQL servers. And then we also have an Express plugin, Express is an HTTP uh, library for JS. We've built a C++ parser that can hopefully be used across the various languages that are going to be able to implement it. And we have an example of wrapping an existing REST server, uh, the Star Wars API, using GraphQL. It's a really nice way to compare and to contrast the way you'd interact with GraphQL versus a REST system. But what's really exciting are the external projects. People who aren't us are building GraphQL cores and GraphQL servers, and people are building apps on top of them. So we have there's a fully compliant Ruby implementation. There's a fully compliant Java implementation. People are actually building on top of those. There's a startup out of Finland called Reindex.io that's building GraphQL as a service as their startup. Uh, you know, I admire your bravery. Uh, <laughs> No, they're awesome. They're really involved and like, you know, we're obviously really supportive and uh, want them to su succeed. Also really exciting is uh, the Financial Times is actually building the next version of their homepage on this. Um, you know, so this is real. We're really overwhelmed by the excitement and the adoption, especially this early in the process. So we are, uh, <coughs> we're, we're making the big step of uh, registering a domain and having a website, uh, you know, and so that's now live. Uh, is it? Dan, are we, we good? All right, we're go for launch. Uh, the button has been pressed. So this is a nice place for like, you know, we're trying to broaden the audience of the system a bit. We have better documentation, links to external resources, and we're gonna try to foster a community at this spot. Um, so I kind of want to step back and talk about a little different subject at this point. Uh, so GraphQL is one of a suite of open source projects that we're working on at Facebook. You know, in addition to GraphQL, and these are just the product facing ones, you have React, React Native, Relay, Component Kit, Nuclide. And on their own, they're all awesome projects. Right? They're all independently useful. But together, we're actually building something that adds up to more. Right? The whole of these things, the whole of these things is greater than the sum of the parts. We really think with all these technologies together, we're really building a new and fundamental way, and what we hope is a better way to build you know, mobile applications. So, you know, take a step back and think about this and where we are as an industry. We've just, like I mentioned before, we've just experienced revolution in consumer computing, right? The mobile revolution. Billions of people carry around these little devices in their pocket that a generation ago would have been considered supercomputers. They have location information, they have connectivity, it connects people to networks, communication networks, social networks, economic networks. You know, it's changing the way people live fundamentally. So, this has been a giant leap forward for consumers. For developers and engineering organization, this has incurred a ton of pain, right? We really think it's been a big step backwards for the process of software development, you know, especially when contrasted with the web, right? So the web on the left, you had open standards. Now in mobile, we're dealing with proprietary platforms with vendor lock-in, right? On the web, you had control of instantaneous, no install distribution. So much easier to deal with, right? You could dynamically change the code you deliver to people. Uh, and you can do experimentation all that stuff. Now you have installed binaries that might live forever. On the web, you had fast iteration, instantaneous feedback. Now you have compile cycles, and it takes forever. Right? It's a lot worse for product development. And interestingly, it also has this organizational impact, and like this team organization impact, and even kind of like this knowledge impact, and that you have to keep more in your head all the time. Instead of just one code base, one product, one unified team, you now have to make platforms and input into how you organize things. So you have an iOS person and an Android person. They might not talk to each other enough. The products get out of sync. Then you need another person to coordinate them. Right? You know what I'm talking about. And then as, as the organizations grow, the problems get more and more difficult. You either organize around products or platforms. It's really, really difficult. And we have a really fundamental belief at Facebook that the right tools the right software, the right abstractions can really fundamentally change these higher order problems. Right? You can solve organizational problems with software. Uh, and that's, we have the opportunity to do that here, but across the industry. 
we, we're building what we like to call, or what we're starting to call, a like, horizontal opinionated platform for this client development. I'm going to explain what that means. So one of the core elements of the strategy is React. Uh, most of you probably know what React is. For those who don't, it's a JavaScript framework for building UIs. And on its face, that doesn't sound like it has that much to do with solving these broader mobile development problems. But why am I saying that it's the core to the strategy's success? Well, React is a success. It has a ton of mind share in the community. It's really taken the front end, uh, front end development community by storm. I've never seen people react <laughs> to a software framework uh, like this. Uh, it's like very emotional. It's actually pretty cool to see. But there's a reason for that. React is opinionated. React has values, meaning that it doesn't try to be all things to all people. And it's not, it doesn't really apologize for it. So if you adopt React, you kind of have to like, you know, you kind of have to like become a believer because it limits what you can do and it imposes constraints, right? It commits to functional programming, immutable data structures. You have declarative APIs that express the what, not the how. And also, you know, the React team has really had the bravery to rethink a lot of best practices and they get a lot of flack for it. But it is really important to acknowledge and respect best practices but not be hostage to them. Because uh, language communities can go and groupthink and all this kind of stuff. So React has, you know, it's an opinionated way of structuring software. <coughs> and originally it's built on the web. But as you can tell today, you know, you know about React Native, you probably know where this is going. We're inserting this layer of software that's gonna make it this horizontal platform that I'm talking about. So you have iOS, React Native on iOS, that's already out. We released React Native on Android today. And there's nothing to prevent it from being ported to other platforms. And it's horizontal because it kind of imposes this layer that you can build common tools, abstractions, and philosophies on top of. But you still have the flexibility to hop down to write platform-specific code to use the proprietary capabilities of each platform that customers expect. So it's a horizontal, opinionated platform. Again, like I just said, unifying software, unifying abstractions and tools but still, you don't lose out on the proprietary capabilities, right? And it's that second part which kind of doomed HTML5-based approaches, as well as the fact that the DOM is kind of a terrible API. Um, you know, and this means that it's not this like write once, run anywhere fantasy, right? We think this is actually like a false idol to chase and creates this like really bad trade-offs because you end up doing a lowest common denominator <laughs> solution typically. Instead, you know, if, if you've listened to React, you've heard this a lot, uh, learn once, write anywhere, right? You learn these concepts one, once and you can apply them across the different platforms that you're targeting. GraphQL is a horizontal platform in the same, in the same way, in that it's an idea, it's an API, it's a specification, and it can be built on top of any sort of backend, right? Any language can support GraphQL because all there needs to do is there needs to be an engine written in one of these, uh, in one of these languages, and those can talk to actually different backends. Right, so again, it doesn't seek to replace the entire stack. It's a fairly thin layer that provides common abstractions so you can build all these tools and stuff. Again, Relay, which Joe talked about earlier, is really a, an amazing example of the power that's unlocked if you bet on these horizontal platforms. Right, Relay integrates React, and by implication, React Native, and GraphQL, and they have very aligned philosophies and as a result, I mean, I think the Relay team has built the best product API that I've ever seen. Um, and the reason why, it can, and it can target this API to any of these proprietary client platforms, and it can be powered by any server that fulfills the GraphQL server specification. You know, it's just super, super exciting. I hope that Relay is only the first of many abstractions and frameworks that are built on top of this common substrate. This is working at Facebook. Take our Ads Manager product. This is a new application that we released <coughs> on both iOS and Android. So you can like manage your apps and whatnot. And you know, puppies, I'm just trying to calm everyone down up here with puppies. Um, both of these apps were built on React Native. They are both native apps. And we're really pleased with the customer experience. And you know what's amazing? A single team without deep platform expertise built both of these apps. Actually, originally, uh, it was budgeted we were going to build the first iOS app in like 18 months with a bunch of engineers we hadn't hired yet because it's hard to get iOS engineers. And I think Tom and Adam were like, eh, how about we go to plan B? 
uh, which is let's use React Native, let's use your existing team, and then you end up building the product in five months instead of 18 months, and then three months later you ship the React the, and you ship the Android product with the same team, reusing 87% of the code. Right? This is nuts. Right? This is like this is what we want with mobile development. Uh, it's really amazing. So, you know, to close, <coughs> React Native, GraphQL, and Relay are only part of the story. We're releasing a ton of software, right? We're making big bets on JavaScript. That's why we're investing in things like Flow and Babel and these type of tools. Um, and there's just so many other things as well. New Clyde is this IDE we're building. One of its primary targets is all these technologies together. And there's still a lot of work to do, though, and we don't have all the answer all the answers, and that's part of by why we do this out in the open with an open ecosystem. But we, we, what we do believe is that mobile development does not have to be like this. That, like, there has to be a better way, and as far as we're concerned, this is the best path, path we see forward. Um, but, and we can't do it alone. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for coming to that scale.